Hi, and welcome to an introduction to spherical and plane waves. Here's a preview of this talk. First, I'm going to set the stage by reminding you about what happened in my earlier talk called Introduction to Waves. If you missed that talk, you might want to watch that one first. In that talk, I explained how a wave propagates as viewed along a single direction of propagation. In this talk, we're going to discuss how waves propagate generally, that is, how direction of propagation might vary as viewed from different locations in space. In particular, we know that waves radiate outward in all directions from a source, so we need to introduce some additional mathematics to deal with that. That's going to lead us to spherical coordinates, that is, the wave equation in spherical coordinates, and then the solution in spherical coordinates. That in turn will lead us to three concepts in rapid order, phase fronts, also known as wave fronts, spherical waves, and plane waves. Finally, we'll see how these three ideas come together to give us the concept of the far field. Let's start with a very basic idea, the Cartesian coordinate system, axes x, y, and z. Any position in space corresponds to a particular value for x, for y, and for z. At this point, it's convenient to define the position vector boldface r which we'll use to define a particular point in space. Specifically, boldface R is a vector which points from the origin to that point in space. This is just a compact way to represent the set of values x, y, and z. In case it's not already clear, boldface characters are vectors. So when you see a caret above a boldface character, the vector is a unit vector. A unit vector is just a vector whose magnitude is 1. So, for example, boldface x with a caret above it is a unit vector that points in the same direction as the positive x axis. I'll usually refer to that unit vector as x hat. We can write the electric field in terms of Cartesian coordinates, as I've shown here. There's nothing new here. I'm just identifying the three directional components of the electric field and noting that each component is a function of boldface r, that is, position, and t, that is, time. Also, we already know the wave equation in Cartesian coordinates, and we also know at least one possible solution in Cartesian coordinates. Here, I'm showing the z component of e, but everything here applies also to the x and y components as well. The particular solution shown here is for a wave traveling in the plus x direction. We know this because we see minus beta times x in the argument of the cosine function. Now, I must inform you of something that we have not discussed, but which is now important to know, and that's this. The direction of the electric field vector is always perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Here, the wave is propagating in the plus x direction. So, e sub x must be 0. That means in this case, only e sub y and e sub z can be non-zero. Now, how do we know this? Unfortunately, for the answer to that question, we must go back to Maxwell's equations. If you're interested, and I hope you are, please check out this reference shown at the bottom of this slide, or in any other decent textbook on electromagnetic waves. Okay. Now we're ready to address the concept of a spherical wave. Common sense tells us that a wave should propagate away from its source. So, for example, some source at the origin, shown here as a red arrow, should give rise to a wave that propagates in every direction, that is, in this case, always away from the origin. We've got propagation along the x-axis covered. That's what appeared in the preceding slides. But if we were located along the minus x-axis, then we know the sign in front of beta will change because the wave is traveling in the minus x direction. Mathematically, this is awkward. Furthermore, if you are located at any point not on the x-axis, then we don't have a ready-to-go expression. In fact, it's plain to see that Cartesian coordinates become awkward because the relevant direction is always outward and not merely in one of the three particular directions, x, y, or z. Fortunately, there's a remedy to this problem and that is spherical coordinates. The basic scheme for spherical coordinates is shown here. The three coordinates are little r, not boldface, which is distance from the origin, theta, which is the angle measured from the x-axis, 
phi, which is the angle measured from the y equals zero plane towards the x equals zero plane. If you know r, theta, and phi, then you know a position in space, that is x, y, and z, or alternatively, bold-faced little r. Now, let me warn you that not everyone uses the same symbols for spherical coordinates. One common difference is that some folks use uppercase r in lieu of lowercase r. Others use different variables in lieu of theta and phi. So just be on the lookout for that. The scheme shown here is common and is the one I will use consistently. Here's the electric field expressed in spherical coordinates. There's no surprises here. The boldface caret notation works the exact same way. For example, boldface little r with a caret, said little r hat, means a unit vector pointing away from the origin. But let me identify one weird thing about spherical coordinates, and that weird thing is this. The directions of the unit vectors change with position. For example, if you're located along the x-axis, then r hat is the same as x hat. If, on the other hand, you're located along the plus y axis, then r hat is y hat. Theta hat and phi hat are even more weird. For example, theta hat always points in the direction in which theta is currently increasing. So, for example, if you're located in the z equals zero plane, then theta hat equals minus z hat. Why do we use such a weird system of coordinates? Well, the answer is very simple. It makes problems easier to solve. Said differently, the small bit of complexity up front makes for a dramatic reduction in complexity later. Okay, some good news. The wave equation for variation along the radial coordinate, little r, is identical to the wave equation for variation along any one of the Cartesian coordinates. This should not be too surprising since the radial coordinate is linear, just like x, y, or z. So for example, if you're interested in how e theta, that is the theta hat directed component of e, how e theta varies along r, well that's no problem. The relevant form of the wave equation is the one shown here, and it looks really familiar. So, you already know one possible form of the solution. It is simply the expression shown at the bottom of the slide where e sub theta naught and phi sub theta are constants determined by the source. And we see beta multiplies r with a minus sign out front, so the wave is indeed propagating outward. Now, once again, I must remind you that the direction of the electric field vector is always perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Here, the wave is propagating the plus r direction. So, e sub r must be zero. That means only e sub theta and e sub phi can be non-zero. So now we are ready to talk about the concept of a phase front. A phase front is the contiguous locus of points in space for which the phase of a wave is constant. You could think of a phase front as a surface over which the phase of the wave is constant. And since the wave is propagating, that surface moves in the direction, or directions, of propagation. By the way, another word for phase front is wave front. The two terms mean essentially the same thing. For wave radiation outward from the origin, the phase fronts are concentric spherical shells around the origin. Since these shells are spherical, we refer to this as a spherical wave. In other words, we define a spherical wave as a wave having spherical phase fronts. Here's that idea shown graphically. The blue arrows are directions of propagation and the black lines are various phase fronts. Now, spherical waves are not the only possibility. Another possibility is a plane wave. A plane wave is simply a wave having planar phase fronts, as shown in this image. Now, ask yourself, what kind of a source makes plane waves? Just think about that for a second. The answer is that there really is no commonly encountered source that radiates plane waves. Yet, plane waves are an extremely important concept in radio science and radio engineering. To explain why that is, I'm going to show you two cases 
in which plane waves become apparent and important. Here's one. Let's say you have a paraboloidal reflector. And let's say you put a radiating source, we call it a feed in this case, we put a feed at the focus of the reflector. The feed radiates spherical waves. That is, as we just explained, the phase fronts radiated by the feed are spherical. When those phase fronts are reflected by the reflector, they are collimated. Collimation means simply that the spherical phase fronts are converted into planar phase fronts. In some sense, this is the very definition of a paraboloidal reflector. Most folks already have some familiarity with this property of paraboloidal reflectors. So, there's one way that you can end up with a plane wave. But there's a catch. The plane wave is only apparent when you are close to the reflector. That is, when you get further away, there is a second consideration. That is, scattering from the reflecting surface. This scattering sprays energy in every possible direction. So, once we get away from the direction of propagation of the plane wave, we see instead a wave traveling in every possible direction from the reflector. In fact, once you get far enough away, these two effects seem to merge, and you see only a spherical wave. Now, let's be clear. That spherical wave will be very strong in the direction of collimation and relatively weak in other directions. That does not matter. We still call this a spherical wave since it is the shape of the phase fronts and not the variation in magnitude that lead to classification as a spherical wave. Summarizing, in this case, we have a plane wave as long as you're in front of the reflector and you're not too far away. If you're far away in any direction, then you see a spherical wave. Here is another way that plane waves become apparent. Let's say you have a spherical wave, and you observe this wave at a great distance from the source. To you, the phase fronts will appear to be nearly flat, so to you, the wave will appear to be a plane wave. This is exactly the same phenomenon that keeps you, on the surface of the Earth, from being able to see that the Earth is a sphere. To you, the Earth is flat, because the curvature is too small to be perceived. For the same reason, we say that a wave that is observed at a great distance from its source is globally spherical, but also locally planar. If we need to analyze how this wave behaves locally, we might as well treat it as a plane wave. By the way, this idea leads us to the concept of the far field, a term you'll hear a lot in this line of work. To be in the far field means simply that it is a good approximation to treat the wave as locally planar even though the global shape of the phase fronts is very different. Okay, let's wrap up by reviewing the main points. A key point has been the concept of the phase front, a surface over which the phase of the wave is constant and which therefore moves with the wave as it propagates. We've introduced spherical waves, which is a pretty good description of the nature of most waves which are transmitted by sources, but which are only apparent as spherical when viewed from a global vantage point. And we've introduced the concept of plane waves, which describe the nature of waves as perceived locally by an observer who is far from the source. And we've pointed out what it means to be in the far field, that is, far enough from the source that the wave appears to be locally planar, despite being globally spherical. Finally, I've pointed out that regardless of whether the wave is spherical or planar, the electric field vector is always perpendicular to the direction of propagation. That concludes this talk on spherical and plane waves. Thanks for listening.